Okay, we're recording. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to be looking at the camera. It's not that I don't love you all, but it's just that this is going to be forever. And it's also for the people in Argentina and in Belgium and in the UK who couldn't be with us today. A lot of people couldn't be with us today. Sorry you couldn't come, but at least you sent your apologies. That's very polite of you. Okay, let me go through. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story about family, and I'm going to tell you a story about friends. I'm going to lay some... Um, facts on you that you may or may not know, um, and uh, we'll take it from there. If there are any questions throughout the presentation, just raise your hands, and I will endeavour to answer them to the best of my ability. Uh, welcome to the Memorial Morning Tea for Teresa Marcella Watergate, if we can stop the clattering of the, and the fiddling with thank you, Stefan. That's forever now, it's on tape. Um, okay. Around 93 years ago, probably on New Year's, a couple were making love. It was not the first time that they'd made love. In fact, they had evidence of 11 other children before that they had had a reasonably successful attempt at breeding. Um, this was my, um, this of course was my mother's parents, uh, Juan Baez and uh, Matilda Millán. Now their story is a little bit interesting, so I'm just going to give you some facts about them. Juan was, uh, we believe, according, at least I have, we have the genetic evidence to back this up, that he was uh, half Guarani Indian, and uh, the other half was possibly of German ancestry, and the name Baez came from a corruption of the word Weiss in German, which means white. Um, so he was a he was a fellow from the back waters of Asuncion. Uh, we believe he knew not. I'm, we probably know more about his ancestry than he did because now with the DNA results, we know, for example, that he might have had. Oh God! There's a fly on the. Go away, fly! <laughs> um, it understands English, yes. Thank you, thank you. And there it is again. In incredible. Um, okay, so one um, was his ancestry was probably mixed uh, Portuguese from Brazil, and um, also the, I'm, I am one percent South South Saharan African, which means that my mother was two percent South Saharan African, which means we're probably dealing with a remote ancestor who was a slave taken over from Africa to work the cane fields of Brazil. Uh, that's about all. I don't know much about his life because my mother didn't get the information and when it comes to family stories, uh, chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And unfortunately my mother, when it came to this sort of stuff, was a bit of a weak link, but we can forgive her. Uh, her, uh, ma her mother, um, Matilde Milian, uh, came from Spanish ancestry and probably with some Basque, so there were some Basque um, involved in her ancestry. She, um, but their story is interesting. As far as we know, and this is a bit of a skeleton in the closet, there will be several skeletons coming out of closets today. Um, uh, they, um, they apparently fell in love when my mother was, uh, my grandmother was reasonably young, and uh, Apparently, uh, she was already uh, pregnant at the time that they were forcibly married together. The reason being um, because in those days you couldn't just have a kid and not be married. Uh, to the point, and it was really shameful for the family, to the point where my grandfather Benito Milian disowned her. Which is a shame because they had quite a lot of money. They were into grocery stores and they had quite a lot of money behind them. But my grandmother didn't see anything of, from it because of the shame of having a child out of wedlock. Anyway, that child turned out to be um, Juan Baez Jr. Who uh, turned out to be a very prominent doctor in Argentina. In fact, so prominent and so well connected, he was actually in the room when the... Uh, doctor who was treating uh, Evita Perón was told that she had cancer. So that's an interesting little side side of our history. 
Uh, moving right along, so there were the other the other seven children who uh, names escape me at the moment. Uh, there was um, Adelaida, there was Beba, there was Jorge, there was Guillermo, there was who am I missing? Jackie, who am I missing? That's all right. We'll get we'll get to them later. Um, so that, that so that happened, and then um, my mother showed up. Now my just by chance. Well, not exactly by chance. What happened, in fact, there's another story there. My grandmother, they were very poor. They were really, really poor. They didn't have any money at all. Um, and with eight, and with already seven children, uh, in fact, there had been 11 and four had died in childbirth, as was quite common in those days, and two, including a pair of twins. Uh, my mother believes very strongly that she was a twin and that the, and that the, um, that the other twin was lost possibly as an attempt by my grandmother to abort, uh, which was again another big shameful thing, uh, but that's the story my mother told. Uh, but it was unsuccessful and my mother, I, I joked for many years that my mother was an unsuccessful abortion, but that's besides the point. What was, what was, really, nice about, uh, what was really nice about it is that was my mother was very, very much loved and she was the last child that uh, my grandparents produced. Um, so, having, having said that, they were very poor. My mother tells stories of having to go to the markets at the end of market day to ask for the uh, spoiled fruit that couldn't be sold at the market stalls so that she and her brother Guillermo would go, not Guillermo, Enrique, would go to uh, the markets and get all the spoiled uh, food uh, so that they would have yet another meal for the week. Miraculously, though, my uh, oldest uncle, um, Juan, who everybody called Pocholo, managed to get a medical degree, and so did another uncle of mine, Guillermo, who was my godfather, who ended up being a prominent uh, pediatrician. Uh, the others uh, ended up being going into business. The two other women in the family, Beba and Adelaida, never, although they did get, uh, Adelaida married, I think, three times. Beba married once, only late in life to a rich man who left her all the money. Um, but that was, that, was, that was long, long after. Um, my mother started uh, her, uh, her, there's a story about Beba later, I'll tell you about it later. Um, my mother started off wanting to go to school. She couldn't go to school because in those days, uh, places in high school were very restricted and because of that she wasn't able to um, get her um, get into high school. She did however get into secretarial college and so she studied secretarialism and also worked part-time as a model. Now she was very proud of her modelling work and there's a famous picture of her which you've probably all seen of her looking like um, this, like the, like the uh, cross between um, Elizabeth Taylor and Audrey Hepburn's love child. Um, so she, she made the most of her looks and, er, and pretty early on Probably in her early 20s, she start, She became the mistress of a man who ran a perfumery, um, Watto, in, um, in Buenos Aires. Now, the perfumery was quite successful for many years. The company no longer exists. My mother actually ended up getting some shares in the Watto company, but they were stolen by her sister-in-law, Porota, who was a real piece of work. Um, so, we, so we're not going to talk much about her, but the point is that everybody knows what she was like and she was terrible and apparently my mother told this other story that her acciones, her um, shares in the company were stolen. Anyway, she and, and, she and um, Gabriel, was his name, had a rather successful um, relationship as such relationships went and in fact what was really nice about that was that um, Towards the end of their relationship, as they knew it was winding down, he actually gave her what I think was one of the most romantic gifts ever. He actually designed a perfume specifically for her. We don't have any bottles of that perfume. She had the recipe, she lost it. I don't know what was in it, but apparently it was a very good perfume, and I've never heard of anybody designing a perfume specifically for somebody totally romantic. Anyway, my mother had a lot of, uh, had quite a few suitors. Um, none of them really um, met up to her standards until she, about uh, when she was about 33 at a party at the Paraguayan Embassy, she met my father. And we're going to now take a little bit of a sideline into my father's life because that's interesting too. My father was born, um, he uh, 
Guy Charles Henry Joseph Watercane um, on the 2nd of July 1925. So he was five years older than my mother. He came from a very, very rich family um, who uh, were very, very smug and self-satisfied about their wealth as the haute bourgeoisie were at the time. There's this wonderful picture in a book that we have, which is the uh, family history that was compiled by the um, by the husband of a cousin of my father's, which is a pretty comprehensive history of the Watercanes. The Watercane family is attested to as far back as the 1200s in a small village in Wales. Uh, I can point it to you on a map later, it's for what that's worth. We believe that around the year 1600, that family, my family, left uh, because of religious persecution and settled in Belgium. At the time, Antwerp, which was a major city in Belgium and still is, was a, was a, a centre for the cloth trade. And so they made a lot of money out of cloth weaving and then diversified their portfolio. There is a rather interesting story about them that I'm not sure is quite true. There is apparently maybe a barony in the family, so I'm sort of, we're sort of vaguely related to the aristocracy. Uh, the story goes that, my, that there was one day um, my ancestor who was extremely wealthy invited the King of France over for a stay and the King of France said, oh, this is a lovely chateau you have here. And, and, and my ancestor said, oh, do you like it? And the French king said, oh, very much. And he said, well, it's yours. And um, the king said, well, thank you, Baron. So it was very easy to buy arist uh, aristocratic titles in those days. All you needed was a shadow. So anyway, the family ended up quite rich. And then World War I came along. And that changed everything. There is a photograph in that album that I talked about earlier where they're all looking very smug in front of a very large car that's all very fancy and they're all dressed very elegantly, etc. All looking very self-satisfied. The date of the photo is 1913. And I look at that photo and says, ah, yes, but I know something you don't. Um, because a year later, the war came and they invested, and they already had interest in London, in the United Kingdom, they invested a lot of their money in making machine guns for the war effort of World War I, which was very successful. It was very, they made all these machine guns. At the end of the war, though, the English government was completely bankrupt and had no money and couldn't pay us. Therefore, and in those days, you couldn't sue the British government unless the British government agreed to be sued. So um, they were never paid for all the money that they'd invested. So what was, a, what was my grandfather, Jean, to do? Because he had 10 children and he, was, and he now had no money. They, the, the, the children were well placed in various marriages, but he actually ended up becoming a priest. In the, in the Roman Catholic Church. It was called a mature vocation, which was, he was allowed to do because he was um, a widower at the time. Um, it ended up that his two, youngest, his two young daughters ended up looking after him for the rest of his life. But for the most part, um, the, other, the brothers uh, all married well, including my grandfather. So we're talking about my great-grandfather, Jean, who had my grandfather, Marcel. Now, uh, Marcel uh, was, uh, was working for Lever Brothers, which is Lever and Kitchen, in the Belgian Congo. We all know what happened in the Belgian Congo. The Bel Belgians were horrible to all the Congolese. I'm sorry, I apologise on behalf of the Belgian royalty and the, and the family for anything that we might have done. But they were probably distant cousins to us anyway, totally unbeknown to my grandfather. Um, he ended up having a, 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 a seaside trip one day and instantly fell in love with this gorgeous woman who turned out to be my grandmother. It was what the French call a coup foudre. They fell instantly in love and they were married in about 1923 and shortly thereafter my grandmother, um, my grandmother Henriette um, gave birth to a son Henri who died. So her first child was born, it was, it was um, born, um, stillborn. Matilda's story, uh, sorry, Henriette's story is also interesting. Her father made an absolute fortune from the um, stock market and had a huge amount of money and Henriette was an only child. 
So she stood to inherit a huge fortune, including a lot of houses in downtown Belgium, which we, if we had kept them, would be worth a squillion now. But, but, what happened was that um, my grandfather was born, my, my father was born in 1925. He was the only son that survived. Another son afterwards, Mark, died at the age of six months uh, from meningitis, as so often people did. My father was basically an only child until the time that he was seven, uh, after which my aunt um, uh, Nicole was born, and, the, and then three years after the twins, Francine and Chantal. Um, all lovely people. Uh, moving right along. So my father grew up um, with his mother's money, but when World War II came around, um, the, the uh, Germans invaded um, Belgium, and there's a story where, there my, where my father uh, was arrested at the age of 14 or so and had to spend the um, overnight in a Nazi-controlled prison cell. Now, the reason that he was arrested wasn't because of anything that he had done, but what the Nazis used to do in order to control populations was they used to get people in randomly from the population and put them in jail overnight with the threat that if there was any insurrection or if there was any trouble, everybody in jail that night would be shot. So that was a great way of controlling the population. Didn't do great things for my father's psychology. You can imagine being a 15 year old and being in jail, not knowing whether you will survive until morning, pretty much screwed with his head, as a lot of people were screwed with their heads. Anyway, somehow, in this, in this process of being, um, it being an occupied Belgium, my father ran away. How we did do this, I was never able to get the full story. But somehow he, slept, he, he stowed away onto a boat that somehow made its way to England where four of his uncles were and he, was man he managed to spend a few years in England where he learned English because his first languages were French and Flemish. Having spent the war continued, he was obviously 20 in 19. Uh, 45, so he didn't see much action, but he did join the RAF. While he was um, in the RAF, um, he was a gentleman officer, we can show you pictures later, blah, blah, blah. He ended up um, marrying a woman called uh, Josephine. Now, Josephine was another woman with money. Um, my, uh, our family history seems to be full of men who managed to marry well and be very good kept men. I'm one of the exceptions to this. Nobody, nobody keeps me. Um, so what happened was my fa my um, my my um, father ends up marrying Josephine. Now Josephine had a father who um, and her family came from Sheffield. They had a fortune because Sheffield was a major steel manufacturing um, centre, and they had a lot large fortune from making cutlery, etc. Shortly after the marriage, my brother Christian was born in 1949. Yes, I think it was yeah, it was in early January 1949. Um, my father, although he must have loved his wife, was really in love with somebody else. He was in he was in love with a woman with, who was actually married to Belgian aristocracy. Uh, to, she was in, in Belgian aristocracy. When the war came, the story, what, the story that I heard was that they had heard that each other had died somehow. And so in despair, they each married other people. Um, as a result, when the war ended, they realized that they were married to other people and committed to that, and they couldn't marry each other themselves. Such is, such is history. The other big thing that happened during World War II was that uh, because uh, the, everybody was on rations, etc., my grandmother said, this is not on, we're, we're going to maintain our lifestyle. So what, we, what she ended up doing was she started selling all the properties in downtown Brussels. Um, that meant that they could buy a lot of food on the black market. And it meant, as my aunt Nicole later said, that they, that they were very, very well fed um, during World War II, in spite of everything, because they were just paying for the roof, through the roof for everything, because they were getting the money from having sold all the properties. Having done that, though, what happened was that we ended up with very, very um, healthy, uh, healthy water canes 
but not nearly as rich as they were. As much as my grandfather tried to convince my grandmother, no, 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 after the war we'll have all of these properties in downtown Belgium and we'll have a lot of money, we'll be able to live well, well, well. And, but my grandmother, Henriette, insisted and so Nicole later told me, that was my eldest son, later told me that when her first child was born, she was very, very grateful to her mother for having done that because it was really important to her to have healthy children. So I think, you know, my grandmother, I think, made the right decision there. Uh, anyway, so moving on, on. So my father was married to, uh, to um, Josephine, who everybody called Joy. Joy was never able to learn French very well. So basically, they were in England. Uh, the marriage wasn't particularly great. And um, Joy ended up having affairs. My father ended up having affairs. And then one, and then one day, uh, while he was in the Air Force, he slipped um, from climbing onto a uh, plane and broke his back. The operation was a real botch, and ended up. And this was like in the late, in the in the early 1950s. Technology, surgical operations weren't, weren't what they were, and his whole spine seized up. He was in pain for a lot of his life. Uh, because the, sp the spines in his lower back fused. It was all a bit of a mess. Anyway, at the same time he got an abscess in his tooth that was driving him crazy. His wife was having an affair. He, his wife was having affairs. He was, going, he was going crazy, so he just decided to, to divorce his wife. He didn't actually do it formally. He just went. He left. He left um, Belgium altogether. His family did not know what happened to him and would not know for decades. We'll get to that part later. So, my father first ended up going to Chile, where he ended up with this uh, uh, with a relationship with a woman called Nora. Uh, at some point, he couldn't stay in Chile because paperwork, bribery, whatever. And so what happened was, he ended up leaving, taking Nora with her, but Chileans are very attached to their um, families. Uh, to their families and to their country. Nora didn't want to stay. She went back to Chile. I heard from my father later that Nora had died, blah, blah, blah. So my father ended up after Chile going to Paraguay. Once he went to Paraguay, it was now nine, early, nine, late 1950s, and he ended up uh, falling in love with an 18-year-old girl. At this time, he was about in his early 30s. It turned out to be a success, uh, very similar to um, Charles and Diana, and about as successful. So uh, we had a more mature man of the world with a rather um, not naive young woman, etc., etc. However, that marriage did produce another child, who my father ended up calling Nicole after his sister. Um, that marriage, of course, did not last. Uh, they were Czech, but they were Czech. So, so somehow Czechoslovakians had ended up in Paraguay. Now, because of the Paraguayan connection. Uh, my father had, had a Paraguayan friend, and when he went to Buenos Aires, because after Paraguay, that was the end of that, uh, he ended up in, in Buenos Aires. His friend invited him to a, a, re a reception at the Paraguayan embassy in Buenos Aires. Um, the first, the, 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 the um, reception had to be cancelled for the first week uh, because it rained really heavily, and this is an important detail because it was delayed by a week, and so my father ended up going to the reception the week after. His friend couldn't go, but my father decided to go anyway. And there, some enchanted evening, um, you may meet a stranger across a crowded room, and that's what happened. Um, my father apparently said to a pal of his who was at the time, he looked at my mother and said, that's my next wife. And that's what happened. So they ended up getting, so my mother was um, sort of more or less blown away by this tall, handsome, um, Belgian, blah, 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 with the exotic background. By this time, he had changed his name to uh, Guy Meus. Um, Meus was actually the name of his, grand, his mother's grandmother. Um, the story there was because my, my, my grandmother, Henriette, um, was an only child because her mother died young and she was raised by her grandmother because her father was absent all the time. He was too busy making huge amounts of money in the stock market and buying properties in downtown Belgium. So he, she was basically raised and she always loved her grandmother, etc. And so I think in a way my father was honouring this by changing his name. The reason he changed his name was because he didn't want to be traced by his family. 
and quite successfully so too. I can't imagine that the Belgians would have ever imagined that my father would end up uh, going to South America. Anyway, so my parents get, uh, met, met, get, got married. Now, um, this was okay for a while. They ended up um, having a they ended up having a farm in Mendoza, I think. I don't know, Chilito it was the place where it was called. Maybe the Argentines can tell me exactly what Chilito is. I can look it up for the, for the business. Anyway, um, they tried and tried to have a child, tried to have a child, nothing was working, nothing was working. Now, remember that, that sister-in-law I told you about earlier, Porota, the really nasty piece of work? She used to say, what's wrong with your father? What's wrong with your husband? To my mother, she used to say, what's wrong with your husband? Does he have testicles full of water? Um, really nice woman. Anyway, the point is, ultimately, um, I think my mother had a miscarriage, and then, and then finally, I stuck. I think, personally, the miscarriage was me, being invited in early, and I said, no, 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 I can't do this, I can't do this, you can't let, make me do this, but apparently my spirit guides and I finally agreed, yes, okay, let's go in, fine, you'll do what you need to do, it'll be fine, it'll be fine, whatever. Anyway, so I ended up being born on the 29th of July, 1965, um, to, uh, I was in the, um, I was uh, born in a swanky Buenos Aires hospital because of the, my mother's connections to my, fa my uncle who was there. He couldn't because it was his sister giving birth. He couldn't actually do the birthing himself, but he ended up, um, he ended up assisting there. I think he actually had some hand in it because I was a breech birth. And so I was born feet first, would have been born feet first because I was a big baby. I was an 11 pounder. I was five kilos. I was huge. And as you can tell, my mother was not a very big woman. So you can imagine having a five kilo parasite inside her, sucking the lifeblood out of her. She always blamed me for this calcium that she lost from some of her teeth. Anyway, it's true. It's true. I, everything I'm telling you is absolutely true. Anyway, so she went, so anyway, I was turned around quite successfully because as far as I can say, all of my eccentricities are my own and not due to any head injuries I might have sustained at birth. So I was so I so I was born to uh, much joy, etc. In the family, etc. Then um, we ended up. Uh, so I would had my earliest years in um, the farm in Chilito. Uh, the stories are there about my mother was really upset because one day the cows ate all her, her flowers. Deal with it. It's the country. These things happen. Anyway. So and then later on, my sister was on her way. Now, my sister, uh, due to the timing, at that time my, father, my parents were already thinking about emigrating to Australia. Now that's really interesting because what happened there um, was my father was working for Chrysler Corporation as an engineer. My father had actually educated himself uh, as an engineer and as a lawyer. Um, but uh, the engineering stuck more than the lawyering. Law degrees in Belgium at the time were just something that you did if you wanted an education. Anyway, so he was working for Chrysler, and the, and the idea came around. My father couldn't stay in Argentina because he wanted to be a citizen, but he refused to bribe the people necessary in order to clear up his paperwork because, as you, as you can imagine, the paperwork was a little bit dodgy. So he didn't want to pay, he didn't want to pay for the... Um, for the bribes, so he ended up think, talk, talking to his company and said, okay, well, we're establishing a new office in Sydney, Australia. My mother said, Sydney, Australia, what does that mean? Does not compute. Um, so my father told her a little bit about Australia at the time. We're, we're talking 1967, and, and, and my mother had this impression that Australia was like a country of complete wildness, filled with black people and kangaroos on the streets. Um, she had a completely distorted idea of what uh, Sydney was going to be like. And, um, but, and she said, are you sure about this? I'm not sure that our daughter is going to be born safely. I think we're going to have to delay this a little bit. And so what we did, we could have gone earlier, but because Jackie needed to be born in Buenos Aires, when my mother felt that we were going to have really good uh, birthing, uh, we had to delay the journey a little bit. Otherwise, we would have been here a little bit earlier, and who knows what might have happened. So, ended, uh, so ended up, um, my earliest memory is um, holding my mother's hand like this, climbing up some stairs um, out of the, I think probably out of the Buenos Aires Metro, I would have been about two years old. The early other memory after that is that we had flown to Panama, Panama City. And I remember it was a day like yesterday where there was total blue, 
no cloud in the sky, and I'm this two-year-old kid um, with the sun in his eyes being pushed up against the wall, wall by my mother with a giraffe, a paper giraffe filled with candies, and she said, hold this, hold this while I take the photo, and so I'm all sort of like, Ugh. and um, she takes the photo, and that photo still exists. If you're interested, we can find it. It's, Jackie's got it somewhere in the family archives. Anyway, so we so we go on the Tahitian, which is a which was a boat. We were boat people, and we crossed the Pacific, and ended up coming to um, to uh, Sydney when I was almost three and my sister was almost two. Uh, sorry, almost one, almost one. So. We ended up settling. We ended up settling in Australia. Uh, Spanish was our first language. I don't know about Jackie, but I ended up learning English by watching Sesame Street. It's amazing I don't talk it with an American accent. <laughs> Although I can do a really good New York Jew. Um, so we ended up. Um, go, so we ended up being in Sydney and settling. My mother found it a very uh, confronting experience to be in Sydney uh, because if you know Buenos Aires. Flat as a pancake, it's an alluvial, it's an alluvial plain. Rio de la Plata is like totally flat. She comes to Sydney and it's all undulations. And there's actually a drawing uh, that I'd made when I was that age of all the hills in Sydney because I was impressed too because I'd never seen such uh, topography anyway. So we ended up, uh, so this is where we ended up uh, settling um, first in Punch Bowl, uh, our, and our first place in Australia was um, in a, in a refuge, well it wasn't a refuge, you said it was an immigrant, it was hostel. hostel, thank you, and it was made out of World War II army huts, those semi-circular things that are made from um, corrugated iron, um, and so apparently I lost myself once but I was always running away and, and exploring and one day my mother followed me I was, and I went to a shop looking for um, Media Luna's croissants because it was a big croissant theme even at that age. So anyway, we went, we went from, um, that, um, from that um, hostel and we moved to Punchbowl and the first school that I went to was Punchbowl Primary. I went there for six months. I have a bunch of interesting stories about that, but that's about me. This is more about my mother uh, and also about her experience as immigrants. So we're going to leave that aside for the moment. But one interesting sideline is that there is a person in this room who was at Punchbowl with me, uh, and that's Delise. Over there, I know you don't want to be. I don't know you want to be pointed out. Delise was a couple of years older than me, but she was actually there at Punchbowl. We might have even met in the playground. Who knows? But anyway, we ended up. I'll send you the tape later. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we ended up going, uh, moving from Punchbowl over to this uh, to the eastern suburbs. Now, in the eastern suburbs, I ended up going to uh, Coogee South Primary School. Now, this detail is really interesting. So, we were there for a couple of years, and um, I'm seven years old, and suddenly I meet up with this other seven-year-old girl, and we became chummy. That girl is here today. Helen, wave, say hello. Now, Helen is very important in this story because... I'm going to cry now. It's just such a lovely story. So you've got these two seven-year-olds, both, both newly immigrant, uh, both trying to make their way in the world. And we conspired because we started talking about our families. And Helen was saying, you know, we've just come off the boat from England. They were the 10 pound bombs. bombs. Um, and, uh, and they said, okay, well, uh, I said, you know, and so your mother, she doesn't know anybody, no, she doesn't know anybody here. I said, well, my mother needs a friend too. So let's get them together. And we did. We did. And... So that's Rosemary there, who ended up befriending my mother. And they had a wonderful friendship that lasted over 50 years. I promised myself I wouldn't do this so much for that. Okay. Anyway, so they got along really well. I don't know how. My mother barely spoke English. 
But Rosemary persisted, and my mother persisted. They must have, who, who understands the chemistry of friendship? I have the most unlikely friends. I'm an unlikely friend to many people. Who knows? Who cares? What's important is people love each other, and they care for each other, and they're willing to go that extra bit for each other, which they did over and over again for decades. Anyway. My parents never really uh, made a go of Australia. Um, what I think it was always a struggle. My father was very um, successful while he was wait while he was working with Chrysler. But what happened after Chrysler was um, that Chrysler wanted to move again, and I think my father was sick of moving, and maybe my mother was sick of moving, and they wanted to settle somewhere. So my father left Chrysler thinking that he'd get another job, high-paying job in a corporation. That didn't happen. For one reason or another, he ended up applying, applying, getting shortlisted all the time and never getting a decent job. He ended up driving cabs to make a living. Um, that's how low he had fallen, if you want to call a cab driver low, which I don't necessarily want to do. Because as far as I'm concerned, if, you can, if you're working and you're making a living for your family, well, that's something. So, um, my father, so my fa he actually also did tour driving for a lot of the time. Um, in Sydney and ended up being a tour guide. Now my mother needed to go to work. So uh, at this point she ended up um, applying to work in a milk bar. But the day, the first day that she was supposed to work in this milk bar, Jackie got sick. So mother had to stay home. As a result, my mother couldn't start her career in milk bars. And she, never, and she never actually worked in that shop. She ended up actually um, working as a uh, domestic in people's houses. Word got around because she was really good at what she did, at being a, at being a cleaner, which was remarkable because our house was always a mess. <laughs> it was like one of, it's, it's those classic stories like the children of dentists have the worst teeth, the children of cobblers have the worst shoes, the children of, of cleaners have the messiest houses. It turned me into a neat freak, uh, but I could only control my own, own, own space. I couldn't speak for anybody else's. Anyway, so they ended up making do as they could, um, and things just evolved and evolved. Uh, my parents' were, finances were always a shaky. Uh, we ended up moving many, many times because we often couldn't pay the rent and getting evicted and stories like that. Or the house would be getting sold from under them, etc. It's a real shame because when my father was working in Chrysler, uh, they were, had saved up a deposit reasonably quickly and had bought some land and were building a house in Mossman. If we'd held on to that, I don't want to talk about it. Okay? Anyway, years, the years go on. My mother, can, my, my mother continues to to um, work. Eventually we ran a couple of hotels where my father did the uh, bookings etc and my mother did of course the cleaning. Uh, my mother never really got a good grasp of the English language. She tried her best but she really didn't like, she didn't think that English was very euphonic which sounds to me like a very strange reason not to learn the language but that was my mother. She had her reasons. Um, we move on, we're just going to fast forward now to my father's death in 1980. Five. He got a brain cancer. Uh, it, um, wasn't, it wasn't particularly pleasant. Uh, for some reason, my father just said to my mother that he wanted his ashes scattered in Botany Bay, which we did. Rosemary was there for, on that day 38 years ago when we scattered our father's ashes, and today she's here to scatter the ashes of her best friend and sister. Once that was over, my mother continued to work in, um, in a, she worked for a shop um, that was owned by the uh, uh, Kenneth Joyce, who was the um, who was a man who had employed her for about 20 years cleaning his house. My mother was there during their, the marriage of the Joyces and their separation and divorce. She was all uh, she was very intimately involved, and she used to tell me stories about them. Which okay, fine, thanks, but do I really need to know the intimate lives of the um, of middle class people that, for whom you um, clean their houses? Anyway, moving right along. Um, 
my mother ended up at eventually uh, retiring at the age of 60 and going on a pension. Uh, uh, we lived, my sister and she ended up living in an apartment block not far, far from here, which was designed by Harry Seidler, the sort of building that Harry Seidler would never live in. Um, she, um, she ended up eventually finishing her studies, uh, doing a PhD in molecular biology. You know this, Sebastian and, and, and Stefan, so you don't need me to fill in, you in on those details. But she ended up moving to Melbourne in 1992. Um, I, I, during that time, had left home. I lived in Perth. I'd gone over. I, 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 I'd gone overseas. I've, I've, and, and I'm missing out an important detail here. Earlier on, I told you that my father had left Belgium, and they had never known what had happened to him. It was a complete mystery. This is how the mystery was solved. One day my mother came to me and she said, your father is dying. And I said, yes, I know. I said, I think we need to make some effort to contact his family. And I said, okay, let's see how I'm gonna do this. So what I did was, we were born with the male's surname. So the first thing I had to do was find out the truth. Now my father was um, sick, and he was, and my parents had, at that time had separated. He was living in a small room in um, the Kuti Bay uh, Hotel. So one day I visited him, and I said, and I, I, I was, I, go, I, I played my trump card. I said to him, "Okay." My father was alone at that time. He didn't have a talent for friendship like my mother did. Um, so he died, he was basically alone. I was the only person he talked to in any regular interval besides my mother. Um, I said to my father, okay, I need to know the truth. I need to know the truth now. Because several years earlier he had t tried to tell me the truth and he had told me about my brother Christian. I was 12 years old at the time. I did not take it well. Um, when my father revealed the fact that I had a, that he had been married earlier, that I had a half brother, and that I had a half brother that I didn't even know about, I burst into tears. And I was very, very angry. I felt really betrayed by my parents. I felt that they had lied to me, which they had, um, to cover up my father's past, which they had, and I was really angry about it. So I really didn't want to know anything for a while. But now my father was dying. I was 19. I needed to, to know the truth. So I basically said to my father, I'm blackmailed him. I said, okay, I need to know the truth about you. I need to know the truth about your life. And I need to know the truth about our family. So you either tell me now, and you start telling me the story now, or I will never speak to you again. He couldn't call my bluff, so he started telling me the whole story. He started telling me the story about our real family name, our real family surname, our re the, the real family, and, and he told me about Christian. And he also told me about the um, my other my half sister in Paraguay. He told me quite a lot, and I started writing it all down. He even remembered the place that he had grown, uh, spent a lot of time, time growing up. 13th Avenue Longbow in, in Brussels. So I had an address and I had a real name. What did I do next? I went to the Belgian Embassy and I looked it up in the phone book. And there they were. All I ever needed was the name. The name unlocked everything. So I looked at that and I said, okay, fine. So I took some, some addresses from the uh, recollections that he had and I wrote three letters in French. They were all the same and basically saying, hello, you don't know me, but I, uh, but I am looking for the following people. I'm looking for Marcel and Henriette Watercane, I believe in 13 Avenue Longbow. And I send another couple of letters to another couple of addresses I had. All the letters got there and all of them came, and all of them came back. Then one day I got, a tele uh, uh, I got a telephone call and it was from my aunt Nicole who had received the letter. She, the moment that she'd received the letter, Nicole later told me, she immediately go, went to her husband and without any introduction said, Claude, I'm going to Australia. So Claude, my uncle, had to deal with his wife suddenly needing to go to Australia, and then the story came out. We later spoke on the phone and she asked me, who are you to hear? And I said, I'm his son. And, and you, also, you also have another niece. You have uh, my sister, Jack, my Jackie. And, um, what happened then was, and then I found out about my brother Christian, what had happened to him. Christian had married, uh, divorced, 
uh, his wife in order to marry his wife's best friend. Um, that's a story in and of itself. Um, the, the, um, and so they all arranged to come to Australia. They managed to make it to Australia in April. Um, about three, about, yeah, early April where we had a very emotional time, as you can imagine. It was very stuff on me. My father was dying. I'm 19, but I'm the only kid, in the, I'm the only person in the family that spoke all the languages because I'd studied French in school and it stuck. So I was translating for them, translating for my mother, blah, translating for my brother, blah, 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 back and forth. It was an exhausting time. I don't want to go to that. Anyway, after all of that had happened and everybody had gotten to know the story and the, gradually the story unraveled of what had happened, so I figured I did my bit for the family karma by writing those letters and doing all of that work. Um, and that was all settled. They ended up going after a week uh, back to Belgium and to the UK because my, my brother had grown up in the UK. He didn't inherit any of his mother's money because what had happened was that his mother died on a dentist's chair when he was, when he was 12. And so he was brought up by his mother's sister. Her, his grandfather ended up marrying another woman who took all his money. So my, so even, so my father, even that thought that my father had had that, well, at least I'm leaving Christian uh, with money because he'll be looked after by his grandfather, didn't happen. Okay, so they ended up, so they ended up leaving. So my father, so my father ended up dying, um, and I ended up later going to Belgium and to the United States, etc., and got to know the family a bit more, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, moving on. So my father's dead, and my mother's decided to, um, she, she kept working for a number of years uh, in the Yum Yum Nut House, which doesn't exist anymore, which was the place that sold nuts. You can tell the story, you can imagine the jokes. Anyway, she um, ended up retiring and living in the Housing Commission. Jackie ended up going to Melbourne, where she became the hero of the family by getting the doctorate that my mother always wanted me to have, but I'm more artistic than scientific, so I did the art, Jackie did the science, it works. Okay, so, moving right on. So, at this time, most of you would have met her or come in contact with her at some point during the, the I mean, an important person here is Steve, who um, ended up, uh, who is uh, Stefan's godfather. Um, he was very much he was very much involved in our family. My mother was very very fond, considered him another son, as she would later consider Gustavo Frangi, who is in the UK at the moment, who couldn't be with us today. But Gustavo, met, I think they met through Marta. Is Marta still here? No. Did, 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 did Gustavo meet you first? I know. How did your how did my mother meet you? Through Gustavo. So Gustavo ended up meeting. So, so that's another thing. So my mother acquired um, sons in the way that I tend to acquire mothers, uh, like my godmother of honour, Claire over there, um, who I've known forever. So anyway, that's pre. Everything after that is probably details that you already know in some form or another, and I invite you to. Um, exchange stories and memories, etc. Over tea. Is there? Are there? And of course, let's just finish now by talking about my mother's last days. I don't think my mother, my sister, wants to go on camera and describe it. But basically, what happened was, my mother's, my mother, my mother, my mother was first um, had to go into home care. Um, get laid at home. Some of the people who were looking after my mother were uh, here today. Thank you very much for your presence. Um, she then later had to go. My mother was very active even in her retirement. Um, she always had literary um, desires and impulses. Ended up writing a book. I believe that all of you have a copy of the book in some form or another. Those who don't come to me later, I still have some copies left. My sister and I actually spent the weekend um, before this one going, a uh, Friday before this going through all of her paperwork, etc, etc. There's a treasure trove of interesting little pieces of paper, including the toe tag that I had from when I was born. I thought that was really interesting. Day. My mother also kept my umbilicus for years. Yes, yes, this is even in the days before people ate their placentas. So that my mother kept this umbilicus as this dried mummified little knot thing. We can't find those. <laughs> 
So my umbilicus is now lost, truly lost forever. I hope wherever it went, it went to a good place. Um, my mother's last days. She spent many years at the um, at uh, the uh, when she couldn't walk, when she couldn't function anymore. I was staying at Claire's one night when I got a phone call saying that my mother had had a fall. She ended up going to Sydney Hospital. At that point, she was in her mid 80s. She really couldn't continue being living independently. Uh, with great efforts, I managed to get her into the nursing home of her choice, where she was there for a number of years. But at the end of the... and, and then COVID happened, it all got very complicated. Uh, at the end, though, I had been basically looking after my mother for 25 years, in one way or another. Uh, she became increasingly dependent on services and other people helping her out, because she acquired a very rare autoimmune disease called inclusion body myositis, which I describe to everybody as multiple sclerosis light. So it's not as bad as multiple sclerosis, but it attacks the muscles that are designed to make your life as easy as manageable as possible. So she lost control of her thighs, which meant she was unstable on her legs, lost control of her forearms, and she, was un she had lost control of her hands, etc., etc. And she also had a partially collapsed esophagus, which made eating an ordeal. It was not very pleasant. But she said to me afterwards, up until about 75, everything was okay. But 70, when she was 75, she ended up getting colon cancer, and a few years later, she ended up kid getting kidney cancer. She survived both of those. Um, but eventually her body just couldn't do it anymore. So we ended up moving her to um, Southern Cross Nursing Home, where she was there for a number of years. But then eventually we decided that I, to be honest, I had also had had enough. I had really, really, really couldn't continue this process anymore. And, um, and, I, and then I, we ended up moving her to Melbourne, and uh, where she at least got to know her grandchildren a bit more because she hadn't been able to see them for a few years. Uh, in the last days, uh, my mother was getting weaker and weaker and weaker. At one point, she ended up getting pneumonia. It was very unpleasant. She told my sister that it was like drowning in her own lungs. She didn't want to do that. Uh, there was an incredibly good palliative care um, that was organised in Melbourne. Uh, they gave her morphine. Uh, she fell asleep and she didn't wake up, or well, at least we, we were in, my, I was on the phone, Jacob was in the room, we at least had the opportunity that even in her last days, we were able to tell her that it was okay, she could go in peace, she could, she could, go, she could go on. That was very important for her, the spiritual life, because the, she, would, she wrote about her spiritual experiences, of which she had many, sometime around um, the, uh, just after my father died, um, she started getting spiritual visitations from um, and some sort of spiritual entity that presented itself like the God Krishna of Indian uh, of Indian uh, religion, which is why I'm dressed like this today. You know, like this. As a result of this, these experiences that were very profound for her and that she documented in her book, she changed her name from Teresa, which she never really liked, to Marcella which is why she ended up being Marcella, after the entity who presented itself, calling itself Marcel, which was only coincidentally my grandfather's name. The, the two things were not really related. So that's why she became Marcella. Oh, and a lot of you knew her under, uh, under that name. Um, so she passed pe relatively peacefully because of the wonders of modern medicine and really good morphine. Um, and died on the 7th of February 2023 at, what time was it? 11.01. 11.01. So that's about it. If there are any questions that anybody would like to ask me. Okay, so signing off. I hope you found that interesting and enlightening. Um, I hope that may have filled in some blanks in your collective memory of my mother. You all knew her in your own way. You all experienced her in your own way. Um, you all had your own relation, special relationship with her. And I'm very, I want to take this opportunity to thank you all for having supported her through all of her years as a friend and in some cases as a real helper. Um, because just physically things were very difficult for her. So thank you all again very, very much. And that's it.
Thank you so much.